church family. It's so good to see you guys this morning on this July 4th morning. Let's all stand to our feet. You know, as I was preparing for this morning, I was reminded that our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Amen. So he's worthy of all of our praise. Let's put our hands together this morning. Let's sing this together. Come on. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. My praise belongs to you forever. We'll say, this is my testimony from there to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. the 
Jesus, it's you. Jesus, it's you. And I believe in the wonder working God, the one 
Just the mention of your name can raise the dead. To all the glory to the only one who came. Jesus is you. Jesus is you. And I believe you're the one to work in God. You're the one to work in God. All the too good to not believe you're the one to work in God if you heal because you love oh the miracles will see you're too good to not believe you're too good to not believe you're too good to not believe after everything I've seen you're too good to not believe I've seen pain and fear dissolve. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen troubled souls delivered, and I've seen addicts finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen cancer disappear, and I've seen pain and fear dissolve. Don't you tell me. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen real life resurrection. I've seen mental health restored. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen families reunited. I've seen prodigals return. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. I've seen troubled souls delivered, and I've seen addicts finally free. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me. Come on, let's prophesy. We'll see cities in revival and salvation flood the streets. Don't you tell me he can't do it. Don't you tell me he can't do it. We'll see glory. It's never say Don't you tell me he can't do it Because I know that he can And I believe you're the one to work in God You're the one to work in God For the miracles I've seen You're too good to not believe You're the one to work in God You heal because You're too good to not believe, too good to not believe, too good to not believe. After everything I've seen, you're too good to not believe. Families reunited, he could do it. Addicts set free, he could do it. 
And on the 4th of July, it feels right to say, turn the heart of America back towards him. He can do it. Amen? Amen. Well, hey, if you're a junior high or a high school student in here, my team's back there with the sign. You can be dismissed to our service at this point. And everybody else, you could go ahead and be seated. It is so good to see you in the house of God today. Welcome to Faith Family Church, Church with the Heart. I'm glad that you're here. And I just want to seriously thank you for making God's word and God's people a priority in your life. There's something awesome that happens when we come together on the weekend and gather with other people who want to have their life centered on Christ. Also, if it's your first time today at Faith Family Church, I want to say a special welcome to you. We are so glad you're here. I hope that when you walked in the door, you felt loved, you felt welcomed here because you are. And guess what? We want to know that you are here. Why do we want to know that you're here? Because when you walk into a church, it should be a place where you feel needed and where you feel known. Needed and known. And listen, we try to make that experience an easy experience to have here at Faith Family Church. If that's what you want your experience to be, there's an orange card in the seat back in front of you. You could take it, fill it out, and then just drop it in one of the big wooden boxes in the exit areas when you leave. Or you could text FFC Orange to 555 888. And what I always try to stress is you're not adding yourself to like an email list of unstoppable emails. All that's going to happen is somebody's going to call you from our team and they're going to be able to answer any questions you may have about being connected here. And uh, they'll also be able to inform you about some areas where you can step into areas that when you're involved, they make it not just a church, but a family. We believe that life change happens in close connection. And we want this to not just be your church, but really a family. That's so uh, much of who we are as faith family. So anyway, we're so glad that you're here. Let's continue on with service. Musician, singer, and songwriter who has sold over 30 million albums worldwide. He has become one of the most influential figures in the history of Christianity in Latin America, not only as a singer and songwriter, but as a speaker, author, thinker, and leader. Today, Marcus travels around the world to empower others to achieve their full potential through principles from God's Word. Join us as we welcome him for an unforgettable weekend at FFC. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be in God's house with you this morning, today, on our 245th anniversary as a nation. Yeah. Today, we have a special service uh, prepared that we're calling America Believe For It. How many of you guys believe that our best days aren't behind us? They're still ahead of us. Amen. So today, we're going to hear uh, from Pastor Jim. He's uh, not with us in person this morning. One of his very dear friends of 40 years is celebrating a milestone this weekend. So he knew it was important that he was there with him. But he wanted to be a part of today. So we're going to hear him on video here in just a minute. And then we're also going to hear from some of our church family who are going to share their different perspectives from their different walks of lives um, on our nation as well as what they're hoping and believing for uh, for our nation we also have some different creativity and music and different things prepared. So I'm just believing and praying that you're going to be encouraged and inspired today. So without further ado, let's hear from Pastor Jim. Good morning, everybody. I sure hope you and yours are having an absolutely fantastic July 4th weekend. Tamara and I are. We're with friends who we've dreamed with, grown with, battled with, persevered with, and celebrated God's victories with for 40 years now. And they've sure helped us appreciate the special blessing God designed great friendships to be. We know beyond a shadow of a doubt, our lives are far more pleasant and far more productive because they're in our life. And I know you're celebrating this weekend with special people like that in your life too. But we sure miss being with you, especially on this special day, the 245th birthday of our nation. And you know, it really affected me recently as I realized later this decade, I'll be able to say to our grandkids, I've lived in more than one fourth of the history of the good old USA. I'm beginning to relate a little more to two Korean War vets I knew. They shared a morning cup of coffee together every week in the morning after the war. And one said to the other one day, you know it's awesome to live in a country where we're free to make our own decisions. I just wish I could remember more of the decisions that I've made. And life goes so fast, doesn't it? And making good decisions is a huge part of enjoying a good life. 
Because in the end, our choices determine the consequences that we live in. And I think we'd all agree that we benefit when we make great decisions. And beginning next week, we're gonna study parables of Jesus that help us see that we have far more ability to help our families, our church family, our community, and our nation do that than we might realize. And fortunately, Jesus didn't leave us in the dark about how to do that, but he taught us practices that should make our hearts confident that we can help other people see the light they need to see. So the burdens that sin has brought into their life are lifted. And so our community is filled with even more people who are rejoicing at how hurts are turning into healing as wrongs are being righted by God in their lives. The theme of today's worship experience is America, believe for it. We're gonna let Jesus equip us to do that, not just in this service, but all this month. And it starts today as we receive help from fellow church members who are passionate about both our heritage as Americans and the future of all of us. They're gonna share what inspires them and what concerns them about our society as they serve in the places where God's called them to serve and as they live with the perspective of a godly person from their generation. Their thoughts are gonna be intermingled with insights I'll share from God's word. My prayer is that inspiration will well up in all of our hearts that our prayers are gonna be answered as we practice what Jesus knows works. Thank you again for honoring God on this special July 4th weekend. Well guys, we are so excited to have you with us today on this special 4th of July uh, service with our church family. So thank you for being here. We're looking forward to hearing from each one of you. And David, Mr. Clemens, we're gonna start with you. I just wanna ask you, why should we as Christians believe that we are stewards of a godly heritage? First, I think we need to, as a society, remember that we, that we do have a godly heritage. Um, we, we seem to have gotten so far away from that. We, we started to see this shift, this massive shift towards secularism. But if you go back through our history, you, you, we, we've kind of seen ups and downs. Um, that's what led to the great awakenings that we've had. If you just read the words of, of Washington, if you read the words of Adams, you know, this country was founded on a, a godly heritage, this shift towards separation of, of church and state, that has been wildly mischaracterized. Don't take my word for it, read Thomas Jefferson's own words. He never even used the term separation of church and state, he used the term wall of separation. And again, it was a protection, it was a protection of the church, not pushing the church away. So um, first and foremost, we need to remember that and we need to, I think, pray that we had have the courage to, to speak that truth and to educate people about that. Amen. Good, David, thank you. From the May Mayflower Compact through George Washington, through our founding documents, there's this understanding that uh, our liberties are granted us not from a government, but from God. And that's the very essential idea that really set us apart as a nation. It was this idea that uh, our inalienable rights come from God uh, and then we give permission to the government to, with a limited authority to create a, an or, ordered society. That understanding was so fundamental to who we are as a nation. Uh, it, it was through the very thread of, uh, of our founding documents and the way we set up our government uh, as a constitutional republic. And so important to the, the, that first generation of Americans uh, in establishing really the DNA of who we are as a nation. Bill, you served our country uh, through the military really for most of your adult life. Yes, sir. And uh, some people don't know this, but you could have lost your life in Vietnam. You saw combat in Vietnam. 2003, you went to Afghanistan and uh, you were a Navy SEAL. You served Navy SEALs. What values motivated you to give so much of your life to that? The values we have, I, I, I'm going to use Mr. Cloud's son, Ian, okay? He's a student of mine and I really enjoy what he has to say. And it's up to us, up to us all right here to make sure that they have the opportunity to run in the racetrack of life and go as far and as fast as they can. And if we don't do that, you know, we're, we're shirking our duty. Just like my father went to World War II, your grandfather, I'm sure. And 
that we have to uphold that so that the folks that come after us, the folks, my students at Faith Academy, have that same opportunity. And that's what America's all about. We can do well if we work really hard and we try to make things go, not only for ourselves, but for other people. So that was important to me to do that and to, you know, to do my little tiny part uh, to see that my kids and my grandkids and Mr. Cloud's son have that opportunity. Gary and Brenda, you've been with us from the beginning, been pillars in our church and prayer warriors, and tell us in your lifetime how you've seen godly values strengthened or eroded. Okay. Well, I want to start in 1952. I was the first grader, six years old, and my brother and I, he was eight, we'd walk to school together, and I never had any fear, never, you know, never thought of anything happening to me. And that just didn't cross my mind. You know, my grandmother lived right next door and I spent a lot of time at her house. And I'd go over there and many times spend the night. And you know, we never went to sleep at night without kneeling on the floor beside her bed and praying. And she was laying that foundation for me. And I just appreciate the fact that I felt safe in my home and I, felt, I feel rich in my heritage. I know that I, my heritage was cut from a cloth that bears strength for me. And I made mistakes later in life, but I had that foundation that I was able to go back to and come back to where I needed to be and do what I needed to do. And you know, as family, that's just something that we can do now, whether it's 1950 or 2021, we can lay a foundation for our family and we can speak into their lives and make a difference. And y'all have done that so well. Uh, anything you want to add? Um, things have changed. When I was seven years old, there was only one business in Victoria open on Sunday. It was a godly time. You know, we, my daddy wouldn't let us even go outside and do anything without, you know, because it was Sunday. You didn't do anything like that. And, when I was in the third grade, I was in charge of putting the flag up. And we, we was very, very inevitable about putting the flag up. That instilled the flag in my heart. And you know, I served under that flag. I respect that flag. And it tears my heart out to see somebody abuse it, to burn it. And I don't think our kids and stuff are taught in school now the values of our country, where we came from, where we are, you know, where we've been. They just assume it just happened. And you know, but to me, you know, 
I think we're in for a turnaround. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us all be grateful for a land's As we raise our voices in a solemn prayer, God bless America. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above, from the mountains to the prairies to the oceans. Brittany and Tyler. So as next generation Americans, you sit and you listen to all this. And what I wanna know is what's going on in your heart? What inspires you? What inspires you the most? And then what do you hear that just kind of makes you mad? And you say, not only must this change, but we can change this. I think for me, something that really breaks my heart and bothers me is the disunity we see in our country today. We see disunity in the beginning in Genesis when Adam and Eve get separated from God. Throughout the rest of the whole entire Bible, we see God trying to reconnect us to Him. And one of the easiest and most effective ways I can do that, or that we can do that, is to just love people. Mm -hmm. Just love people the way that Christ loved us. And once we get that fire and that passion, that love of God deep down in our hearts, and we begin to love people the same way, we're gonna see restoration in our cities, in our community, and in our country. Yeah, yeah that's good. For me, it's what we are seeing so much on social media, on television, and in music. It's affecting the younger generation. And I really worry about the next generation, especially not only like people my age, but just the younger kids in general too. Yeah. Good, really good. Leah, you are newlywed, you yeah. and Coley, but you're a social worker in town and have been for a number of years. And so I know you see a lot. You see a lot that probably we don't see. So tell us what it is that we can't ignore as a community and what uh, we need to do to see healing. I think first and foremost, we need to like not ignore the fact that there are so many people who are truly hurting. Depression, they're oppressed, anxiety, anger, all of these different things, we can't ignore that. The hurting, Jesus said, mm -hmm. when you do it to the least of these, you do it unto me. So what do they need to hear from us? What do they need to mm -hmm. see from us more? The people that are really hurting, what do they need more from the church? Just being real with one another and just, you know, letting each other know that we all 
struggle and go through these difficulties in life. You know, so it's just a matter of us just you know, breaking out of our, our comfort zone and just letting each other know this is what, you know, what we struggle with and not be afraid to, to verbalize that with people. I think as a body, church body, needs to be sensitive to all people's needs. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we need to be sensitive to what is trying to be done to our country, they're trying to pour our morals down and destroy society. And How are they secretly trying to steal our values? Well, th there are a lot of ways uh, that our, our values as a nation are really under attack right now. Um, and, and it really takes us as a people really standing up in whatever our walk of life is. I think of what you said about, you know, when people say the church oughta. I, I feel that same way about, well, <laughs> you, you as a nation oughta. And, and just the reminder that it's we the people that defines us as a nation, not we the government. And the same is the, it, true for the church. It's, the church is a body, it's, it's people. And, you know, a lot of times when it comes to government, people will see a problem in society and the first thing they think is White House, you know, or, you know, I'm sure in a congregation, it's pastor, you know. Uh, but really, it's nothing stopping you from going to meet the need of the neighbor or doing a, 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 something to reach out. And that is the church reaching out. That is you being an extension of the church. That is you being a part of a nation that loves uh, people. Um, and, and, and us just being able to take proud of that and, and our responsibility and understanding that uh, you know, liberties. Uh, come with a responsibility and part of that is how we love our neighbors and how we love our communities. There is a sound I love to hear It's the sound of the Savior's robe as He walks to the room where people pray, where we hear praise as he hears. There is a sound I love to hear, it's the sound of the Savior's robe as he walks. To the room where people pray, where we hear worship hears. Awake, my soul, and sing, sing His praise. Sing his praise aloud. Oh, wake my soul and sing. Sing his praise aloud. Sing his praise
sing. My soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Michael, you have been, a lot of people don't know, but you were on our team here for a number of years. Yes. You were on staff with us and served. Your family's been a big part of our church family for lots of years, and we love y'all. We just wanted to ask you, what do you see that gives us hope for this nation? It's a nation we all love and we're all passionate yeah. about, but what kind of hope can you give us? Well, I have to tell you, that's a word that I've meditated quite a bit on the last few months, um, because we are a nation in need of hope, for sure. Uh, and so I, I went to be thinking about scriptures, you know, that had hope in it. And I, I remember thinking about the scripture that came to mind, uh, it says, hope does not disappoint. And I remember thinking, well, I, I don't know, my hope feels disappointed right now, so let me dig into this a little bit more. Uh, and, and the rest of that scripture talks about the context of that. It was so interesting to me. It says, suffering pers produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And I thought that was so interesting because I expected suffering to produce perseverance. I expected perseverance to produce character, but to make the jump from character being what produces hope was just very interesting to me. I uh, wasn't even really sure to think about that, but then I also thought about Jeremiah 29, 11, which we all know, but I think fits the context of the time we're living in right, right now better than probably any time that I've been in, in, in the church. And that is, you have the people of Israel going into captivity and Jeremiah is saying, you know, I have a hope and a future for you as a people. So work for the peace of your city, he says. Stay there, marry your kids, work for the peace of your city. And then by the time we get to Jeremiah 30, he says, I'm gonna rebuild the walls. I'm gonna rebuild the temple. Your, your people are gonna be blessed. I'm gonna do all these wonderful things. And then I got to thinking, what happened between that promise in 29 and when we see it fulfilled in 30? And that's when we get these really neat stories like Daniel in the lion's den when he was the passed a law that said you can't pray anymore and he said I'm gonna go and I'm gonna pray like I've been praying all along you know we have the story of Shadrach Meshach and Abednego during that time when they built a tower and they said all of society's gonna bow down to this tower and they said everybody else might do it but we're not gonna do it even if we have to face the fiery furnace we're not gonna do it you know and then we also have Esther in that time you know, it, which she went before and ended up saving her people because she believed she was called for such a time as that. And, and so what excites me and what gives me a, a hope is what I see happening in the community of believers where I see people taking hold of that kind of faith uh, and people standing up wherever God has placed them in society and living with that kind of boldness that's really meant to define our faith. You know, when we get to Hebrews 11 and it talks about the hall of fame of faith, these are the kind of people that it talks about, you know, and it goes on, it says, these are the people who administer justice. These are the people who brought down kingdoms and brought them back up again and did all these wonderful things in their community and society because they live with that really kind of bold, bold, courageous faith, you know, and so, you know, it could be a time where we feel like our hope is disappointed, but what gives me hope is what I see happening, you know, just even in members of Congress who are believers starting to take that kind of uh, faith, but also everywhere I go in the church to see, uh, in, in, in communities all over our, our country to see people taking that kind of seriousness about how they live out their faith. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. It's so prevalent that what the enemy is meant for evil, God is bringing good from it. We've never prayed like we're praying. We've never stood right. like we've stood. We've never got in the word like we have. We've never fought like this before. And it's just what this is, I mean, God has taken what the enemy has meant for evil. And I think the enemy's real sorry he's messed with us. Mm -hmm. I really do.
It blessed Tamara and I so much to hear from people that we respect so greatly, especially church members from different generations with such different backgrounds as Americans, yet all of whom are engaged with hope in their heart regarding our nation. My prayer is that today all of us are going to feel a deep sense of confidence concerning our days ahead and concerning our destiny as American Christians. First, let me share why listening to their words affected my heart the way it did. Then afterwards, I want to look at a truth together from God's Word that I believe really gives rich insight that should produce incredible confidence in our heart. You know, first, as I listened to our fellow church members, I noticed how every one of them had Jesus touch their heart and transform their life. So they know that God's presence can do incredible things in anybody's life. Next, I noticed how deeply they cared about our future and about our neighbors. And I could sense they had a genuine desire in their hearts to do right by everybody. 
You know, that's what transforms the world. When the church has compassion and a passion to make a difference, it changes everything. And throughout history, those perspectives have always proved vital to transformation. Because let's face it, a lot of people have opinions, but transformational people have values that everybody knows our society needs to embrace. And sin will see to it that those values are challenged in every generation. And that's why it's been well said, though our Constitution was penned with a feather, we must never take it lightly, right? That statement's not just cute, but it's the challenge of our generation. You know, as an American history major who felt called to pastor as I studied, and as a person like most of you who cares deeply about the choices we make and their effect in our community, I really believe our challenges in 2021 can only be solved through practicing our faith in ways that bring forth a great awakening. There are political perspectives for sure that can be debated and even should be debated. For instance, what's a fair tax rate for our citizens based on their personal circumstances and our national circumstances? And what part of that tax rate do you think should come from our local taxes, state taxes, or federal taxes? And how much tax revenue do you think should come from income taxes versus property taxes versus sales taxes? You know, godly people can certainly see things different ways. But I think all godly people would agree that a great nation cannot be built upon ungodly values. And today we're going to look at a scripture that not only calls us to live aware of that, it tells us the action steps to take if we want to see our nation changed. Let's read Proverbs 14, verse 33 and 34 together. And I'm going to read verse 34 first, which expresses the critical reality that we must live aware of as God's people. Then we'll study the action steps that God calls us to as his people. But this is what verse 34 says. It says that righteousness exalts a nation, but we need to live well aware of the fact that sin is going to condemn any people. You see, God wants us to know that there's only one way for a family, for a community, for a nation to be great. And that is we have to value the righteousness of God. But verse 33 tells us something really, really important too. And this is what it's, it says. It says that wisdom reposes in the heart of the righteous. And even among fools, we have to make that wisdom known. Now, why is it important that we live in the, that awareness? Well, because righteousness isn't righteousness until it acts on what's right, right? It's just knowledge until somebody makes a decision that they're going to act upon what's right. And, and God says that we need to understand that in society, sin is going to naturally make people foolish. I bet you were foolish as a child. I bet your childhood friends can bear witness to your foolishness. And for sure, the Holy Spirit knows how foolish we all were in our childhood. And we still need God to guide us into better choices that bring better living today. But let's talk about this. How does righteousness form in people's hearts that exalts nations? Well, again, it starts with knowing what's right, but then it, it takes people who are wise enough to lead our nation into what's right. And that's what Jesus wants to help us with, with. He wants us to learn to practice our faith in ways that inspire people, that their life can be blessed through the righteousness of God. God calls us to live with the confidence and the capability that's necessary to do that. So he tells us in verse 33, expect resistance, not receptivity when attempting to bring other people to righteousness. Listen, that's what this cancel culture is all about, isn't it? In case you're uncertain about what cancel culture is, let me share the Wikipedia definition. It's a modern form of ostracism in which someone's thrown out of professional and social circles. And Proverbs tells us to expect that when trying to convert people from ungodly values to godly values. Listen, I'm a first generation Christ follower. And I remember my peers saying to me, you're telling my girlfriend not to do what with me? You're saying we shouldn't do what at our pop parties? And honestly, my friends thought my elevator didn't reach the top floor. And some of them thought a blow to my head might remodel my brain and help. But listen, when did that environment start to change in my high school? Why did we experience revival in my high school? Because people became aware of the fact that sin was hurting people 
and that righteousness was the best way to live for all of us to be rewarded. And that's why God calls us to care deeply for people and to make them conscious of the benefits that righteousness can bring into their lives. Listen, when that happens, it causes more and more people among us to esteem God's ways and to embrace God's ways. And that's how spiritual awakening happens in America. But there are many among us today who really believe in God, and they believe Jesus is God's son too. But we have to help them perceive the rewards of righteousness better. So they're motivated to practice it in society at large, and then righteousness will start to exalt our nation instead of sin condemning and cursing so many people. So let's look at Proverbs 33, 1433 again, and let's learn how to do that. It says, wisdom reposes in the heart of the discerning. To repose means to lie situated in a certain place. In most homes, teenagers can repose in their beds too long, right? We have to get them out of their bed, get them believing in their potential. Well, God says the same is true about you and me, that we have wisdom in our heart, but it has to get out of our heart and it has to convince society if God's going to exalt our nation. Now, let me tell you why I have such strong hope in my heart regarding that this morning. It's because I believe that God has enough really good people with the right stuff in their hearts all across America today. And I believe a really special work can happen in this hour because of it. But the stuff can't stay here. The Bible says even among fools, wisdom has to make herself known. Then righteousness will exalt a nation. Now, what is a fool? A fool is a person who acts unwisely. And listen, I've been there, done that too often. Fortunately, the t-shirts are so old, they're not around anymore. They've been thrown away a long time ago. But how can we help one another as Christians quit making foolish decisions and begin making righteous decisions that God rewards? And how can we help a lot of people in our community do the same? And how can we see that spread across our nation? Well, we're going to start learning next week from three parables that Jesus taught about practicing our faith in ways that are not just pleasing to God, but they also have the best chance of helping a lot of people see the light, have the burdens of sin lifted from their shoulders, and because of that, there'll be way more people rejoicing in God's love. It's interesting that Jesus taught these parables right after Matthew 24, when he first taught his followers, expect religious deception, expect natural disasters, apostasy, wars, calloused hearts, and persecution to be commonplace. Expect there to be a lot of pain and difficulty in the end times. And then afterwards, Jesus tore into Israel's religious leaders, and he made it clear God isn't pleased with selfish, shallow, showy faith that's more concerned with appearance than it is righteousness and the blessing of people. But then after Jesus talked about how times would be tough, he told his disciples, I want you to be confident and I want you to practice your faith in ways that please God who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth according to 1 Timothy 2 verse 1 to 4. I'm going to close with reading those words that the Apostle Paul taught to Timothy, his spiritual son, when he said, Timothy, I urge then first of all that prayers, petition, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, not for some people. We need to be praying for everyone. Then he specified for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Do you notice God wants people to be drawn to godliness and to holiness? It's not enough for us just to, you know, share our opinion and contend for the truth. God needs people to feel his heart and to be drawn to holiness that can make our nation whole again. And I want to thank you for the privilege of being your pastor because I believe in the decade ahead as we do this, we're going to have a lot more to rejoice about because of what God's doing in people's lives than we have to regret. And isn't that really what it's all about? Let's live in such a way that people all around us live with much more gratefulness for God than they have despair in their heart because of what sin has done.
Christ alone, our chief cornerstone, no other foundation can we build upon, not philosophy, nor the wisdom of says blessed is the nation whose God is Lord. So I'm inspired to pray for good and godly marriages because they can, they will, and they are happening in our nation in the name of Jesus. I'm inspired to pray for men to rise up, to be the husbands and to be the dads that God has called them to be. I'm inspired for women to nurture their families and to raise them up in the way that they shall go. I'm inspired for young people to not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of their heart. I'm inspired for the kids, for them to say, hey, nobody's going to look down on me because I'm young, but they're going to set an example for all believers. I'm inspired because the enemy, he is not going to have the church for the Bible says, our God, he will build our church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Hey, do you have faith this morning that our days, that our best days as God's people are ahead of us, not behind us? Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Come on, let's sing it. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, we're your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church. Build it from the ground up, we're your church. Build your church, build your church. Build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church, build your church. Build it from the ground up, we're your church. Build your church, build your church. Build it from the ground up, it's your church. Build your church.
build your church. So build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. Build your church. Build your church. Build your church. Build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church. Amen. Amen. Come on. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Sometimes we got to stop and we got to remember, hey, it's his church. He's the one building it. He's the one that will protect it. He's the one that will cause it to thrive in any day, in any age, among any generation, because that's his baby. We got to trust it with him. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against his church. Amen. Let's, let's pray for that, and let's believe that this morning. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes? Heavenly Father, thank you that we get the chance and the opportunity to be a part of your church, to be a part of building your kingdom. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. If we're ever confused about what it means to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, it looks like bringing righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So Lord, forgive us for the ways that we've missed that and help this next wave, this next generation of church and in America be a people that characterize the kingdom of God and spread righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let us submit ourselves humbly before you and God really take righteousness seriously. Let us live in a way that causes peace to be had. Let us excel at things that cause the world to experience peace. And God, as we live in the harmony that peace creates, let there be the joy of your Holy Spirit, God, so that your kingdom is really coming to earth. We know that we are citizens of heaven, God, and that on earth we live to make earth more like our true home in heaven. God, thank you that we get the chance to live in the United States of America. God, a country whose opportunity uh, was paid with such a high price. Let us steward that blessing, God so that we're really bringing your righteousness, peace, and joy to everybody, God. And we can be an example in the future of what it looks like to bring heaven down to earth. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being your people. Today, we realign ourselves with your kingdom and with your name. We are seeking the advance of your church. Lord, may we be a people of compassion and grace. May we be unified in this moment to go into the world, showing the world what it looks like when your people love. Help us to know how to proclaim your truth with your love. May we be voices for the voiceless, seeking justice for the lost and hurting. May we pursue the mission you have put in front of us to proclaim the gospel to every nation, to every tribe, and every tongue. May we be passionate for your power and hungry for your presence, rejecting all substitutes that this world will have us put in your place. May we be a people of grace, proclaiming redemption and not condemnation, rejoicing always in the message of your reconciliation, we declare that this is holy ground. Lord, take this moment as a rededication of our commitment to our faith and our reverence for holiness. We are awakened in this hour to be the church that you desire. We are not going to be a people who shrink back when it comes to your name, but we're going to be a people who shine bright in the darkness and the gates of hell will never put out the light of faith, family, church. In the name of Jesus, somebody shout with me, amen. 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 Hey, can you guys do me a favor and help say thank you to all the creatives who were involved in today's service. Everyone on stage, the production team that we don't get to see, the crew, thank you guys so much for all the time and effort that you gave. Hey, we want to do one thing before we go, the most important thing that we do every week. So go ahead and uh, take a seat for just a second. You know, we do things like today because we really believe that Jesus can make such a difference in our society, in our world. And we believe that because we've seen 
firsthand the difference that he makes in our own lives. And if you're here this morning and maybe you've never had the opportunity to give your heart to Jesus and to experience the freedom that we're talking about today, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. We're going to say a prayer here in, in just a moment. So if everybody would bow your heads and, and close your eyes for me. And if you'd like to give your heart to Jesus this morning, if you say, man, I, I want to experience the freedom that you're singing about. God sent his son Jesus to die so that we don't have to live uh, in the burden of our sin and our shame, but that we can live free and experience life and life to the fullest. So if that's you this morning uh, and you'd like to say that prayer with us, uh, I'm going to pray, but I just want to know uh, that you're praying with me. So would you, on the count of three, would you raise your hand for me? One, two, three. Say, I'd like to give my heart to Jesus today. Amen. I see that hand. I see those hands. That's awesome. Well, hey, maybe you're here today and you say, you know what? I have given my heart to Jesus, but I haven't truly lived it. And uh, I would like to rededicate my heart. I'd like to come back to him today. If that's you, would you uh, lift your hand on the count of three for me? One, two, three. Awesome. I see those hands. I see those hands. Man, that's so awesome. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And as I pray, I just want to invite you and encourage you uh, to repeat after me. And don't let this just be words that you repeat, but let it be a prayer coming straight from your heart to God this morning. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus and the price that he paid. I know I'm a sinner in need of grace. So today, I accept salvation. I declare you were Lord, and I thank you that I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Well, faith family, can we let these people know how excited we are that they chose to give their heart to Jesus? Man, congratulations. That is so awesome. And I want to encourage you this morning that, hey, uh, you know, things aren't perfect. Life isn't perfect, right? I do believe that a change happens in our heart when we say that prayer. But life isn't perfect. That's why God gave us the Bible, so that we can learn how to walk our faith out. So we have a packet for you. It's uh, in a white packet. You can get it on your way out, or uh, one of our uh, prayer team can make sure that you have it before you go. But there's just a gift in there, and there's some stuff to help you know uh, more about the decision you made and how you can take your next steps in your walk with Jesus. So make sure that you get that. And if you're joining online, they're going to put something up on the screen to let you know how you can get that as well. You can go to myfc.com slash new life or give us a call at our church office. Faith family, one more time, can we give our friends a hand and let them know how excited we are and proud of them this morning. Awesome. Well, hey, we're going to do one more thing before we go. And I'm going to give us the opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings to God's work this morning. And hey, as I was getting ready for this service and and just thinking about, you know, our nation and specifically our community, I was just thinking about how grateful I am that this place, that Victoria and the area around us has people like you. That Faith Family Church is here because of some faithful and generous people. So thank you for living the way that you do, you know. Uh, when you think about it, God's doing an amazing work. He's an awesome God, right? And it's easy to think. He probably doesn't need little old me, Right? But it's cool that he chooses to include us. In fact, the Bible says that he, he encourages us. He asks us to live generously, to give of our tithes and offerings so that he can make a difference through us. Why? Not only so that, you know, he can do things in our world, but also so that we can be a part of it. Because when we give, not only does it change the world around us, but it, it also changes us, right? It changes our heart. It helps us take our perspective off of the earthly perspective and onto the heavenly perspective. So I just want to say thank you, Faith Family Church, for living with the heavenly perspective so that we can see our world, we can see our nation, we can see our city and community change, and ultimately we can see our homes changed. Amen? Amen. So let's take a minute to give of our tithes and offerings, and then we'll pray and we'll go. It was so good to be with you guys this morning.
All right, let's lift our offering to the Lord today, and let's pray over our offering today. Amen? Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege of giving. And, Father, as we give our tithes and offerings today to your work, I pray that blessing would come to us. I pray that every need that the church has would be met. And so, Father, thank you for the privilege of giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's give the creative department a really good hand again for such a great presentation today. Wasn't that awesome? I don't know about you. I was inspired. And uh, I'm inspired because uh, good days are still ahead. Amen? And that's what we're believing for. So uh, we're going to ask the prayer partners to come here in just a second. But let's stand together and uh, let me pronounce uh, a blessing over you that we do each service as we declare this over each of our lives. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. God bless you. Go have a great day today. Happy Fourth of July.